Welcome to the ERA EDTA CKJ e Journal Club. Um, each e-seminar usually takes place on the last Thursday of the month at 1700 Central European time, which is 1600 Oxford University Press time in the UK. Each e-seminar picks from a topic from a recent CKJ original research or key review article, and your author or authors will introduce their work. We'll have at least one expert on our panel and it'll be moderated by CKJ Editor-in-Chief Professor Alberto Ortiz and or myself, Will Harrington. I'm an Oxford-based nephrologist and epidemiologist. So the discussion lasts for up to an hour, will be fairly informal, but we'll encourage live. And I hope you have lively questions typed into the Zoom Q&A box. We are recording, so it will be made available on various video platforms afterwards, so keep an eye on social media for links. Now, today is our eighth CKJ e-seminar and the first seven e-seminars have avoided the focus of, of, uh, of uh, our lives in the last few months, the global pandemic, recognizing that renal disease doesn't stop. But this month we've got some really nice results which are very relevant to this time point um, for our renal patients. And, and we'll be discussing how long antibody titers are maintained following natural exposure to COVID-19. And the lead authors of the CKJ original search paper from this COVID um, free at study are Dr. Roberta Alcalza and Jose Portoles from the University Hospitals Infanta Leonor and the University Hospital Puerto del Hierro, both respectively in Madrid in Spain. Welcome to you both. Hello. Hello. Hi. We are also joined by Maria Jose Soler, who is our incoming CKJ editor in chief from next June, and Professor uh, Ron Gansevoort, who's a Dutch nephrologist and professor of internal medicine from the University uh, Medical Center in Groningen, who needs a little introduction. Um, he's kindly agreed also to share some exciting complementary data from the RICOVAC 1 study. Um, some preliminary results assessing the immune responses following vaccination in people with advanced CKD, um, covering um, uh, stages four or five, including dialysis and transplantation. So welcome to you both. Um, I have to confess I'm really rather excited by today's double bill. Um, there's lots of interesting data. Um, we've got a lot to cover in an hour. So I think without further ado, we should start with Roberto and Jose and your COVID free app data from Madrid, if you'd like to share your screen. Yeah, we are. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much for the introduction. These are our disclosure of interest. And this is the visual abstract of the paper we are going to discuss and that deals with SARS-CoV-2 immune response on hemodialysis patients. We all know the global impact of COVID pandemic in Spain will have suffered from four waves. The most intense and lethal has been the first of March and April 2020. And this, is to, this study was developed at the end of the first wave. Uh, we all the, all the nephrologists, shortly after the onset of the pandemic, we became aware of the vulnerability of patients on hemodialysis. The COVID register of the Spanish Society of Nephrology showed that patients on hemodialysis that have high mortality rate with COVID, 27% uh, in this register. And in addition, we know that there are risk factors for COVID in these patients, such as uh, they have to go on a shared healthcare tra transportation to the dialysis facilities. They spend there, they are more than four hours and many of these patients live in nursing homes. That's the reason that uh, shortly after the onset of the, uh, sorry, that the guidelines were soon published to reduce the incidence of infection in hemodialysis facilities with a strict protocols, measures to early detection, the virus infection, 
And these measures include the triage, the triage at the center entrance and isolation and reverse transcription polymerase chain, PCR, in any patient with suspected infection. What we have known from serologic studies is that there is a high prevalence of asymptomatic infection. Around 40% of the hemodialysis patients are asymptomatic, and this may increase the risk of nosocomial infection in our hemodialysis units. So in this context of high COVID incidence, high mortality, high percentage of asymptomatic patients in hemodialysis, and not detected many of them with clinical screening at the entrance of the facility, we ask ourselves how to use diagnostic tests to optimize detection of COVID. And <clears throat> this is the, the COVID triad study. Uh, who, the main objectives of this study we are going to, to share with you is to assess by PCR and serology the prevalence of SARS-CoV infection in a large representative sample of hemodialysis patients from Madrid, to assess the dynamics of the antibody response, and to assess the prevalence of asymptomatic SARS-CoV infection in our patients. This is an observational open prospective multicenter study with 10 hemodialysis facilities, eight managed by FRIAT. FRIAT is a the Fundación Renal Inigo Álvarez de Toledo. This is a non-profit institution, institution. And also participate two nephrology departments from hospitals of the public health system. The study population were all hemodialysis patients, older than 18. On 15 April 2020, that was the start of the prospective study. The study has two designs, a, retrospect, a retrospective one from 1 March to 15 April. And we analyze the patients diagnosed with symptomatic COVID. On 15 April, the patients were prospective included. And we perform a PCR and serology at points zero. And four weeks later, we perform a second serology. It's important to note that at the point of the first serology, the accumulated incidence of COVID infection in Madrid was going down. This is visual, this is most, most visual here in this slide. And we can see that this is the first way, and these are data from COVID admissions in Madrid hospitals. So we can see that uh, in this first wave, the public health system in Madrid was very stressed by the infection. When the incidence of COVID were, was decreasing, we performed the first serology and the second serology four weeks later. But we measure all the patients that were diagnosed with symptomatic COVID disease eh, from 1 uh, first March to 15 April. The methods that we have uh, assessed are these. Serum was tested for anti sars cov 2 antigens, EGA plus EGM and e, uh, IgG. And we, um, we test antibodies from spike glycoprotein and nucleus capsid with an ELISA. With this sensibility and specificity, and uh, we perform a, a, a PCR, a normal PCR, with these two, two methods. The study variables report were past history of COVID-19, demographic data, morbidity data, and known risk factors for SARS-CoV-2 infection, mainly shared ambulance transport, known exposure to an infected partner, and living in nursing homes. And these are the results. On 1st of March, there were 818 patients in hemodialysis. Through 15 April, 156 patients had been diagnosed with symptomatic COVID disease, and we have 42 exitus. This gives us a mortality rate of 31% in our patients. <clears throat> 
This is the group one patients with prior symptomatic COVID disease. The rest of the patients is the group two, 672, with no previous symptomatic COVID disease. What difference group one from group two? Well, symptomatic COVID were older and had more risk factors for COVID, including living with an infected partner or in a nursing home, uh, this is, or sharing ambulance transport or previous hospital admission. When we perform the first uh, serology, uh, we, we can see that in group one, there was only 75% of patients with symptomatic COVID disease, uh, we can find only antibodies in 75% of the patients. In the group two, we perform PCR to all the patients, and in nine of them, all of them asymptomatic, uh, had a PCR positive. From these patients, only seven from the nine had antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 antigens. The rest of the patient is, are patients without positive PCR and without symptoms. And they have 94 of the patients had antibodies to uh, SARS-CoV. So as, as a whole, COVID prevalence in patients without clinical suspicion was 15%. What is the difference between patients who have been in contact with the virus and those who have not? Well, in a multivariable analysis, we found only two variables. Living in a nursing home here in Madrid, uh, there was a very high incidence of patients infected in nursing homes and shared ambulance transportation. And what about the second serology? At four weeks, and this is our results that I think that are very important, in the group one, people with symptomatic COVID uh, Previously, there was 15% uh, of the patients that became antibody negative. Those patients with PCR positive, positive PCR, we found that there was no patient that became antibody negative at four weeks. But in these patients that were positive to any antibody uh, in the first serology at four weeks, at four weeks, 77% of the patients became antibody negative. What this implies is that at four weeks, a large proportion of our patients have inadequate immune response. Our hemodialysis patients don't respond uh, in an adequate form to the SARS-CoV-2 infection. And we, when we search which were the, the main variables that could, could uh, distinct between patients with adequate immune response or inadequate immune response, we only find that a symptomatic COVID disease was the only variable that could account for an adequate immune response. And these results raise several questions. First is the mortality rate. We have found a very important mortality rate, greater than that reported in the general population, nearly 31%. When we compare these results with the mortality rate in Spain, in people elderly and, uh, than 70 years old, uh, in the same dates, the mortality is approximate, approximately the double mortality. But this is what we have uh, report in other uh, dialysis units. The second result is that the seroprevalence in hemodialysis patients is very high. 22% of the patients had antibodies. And this is approximately uh, the double that uh, they reported in the NECOVID study, that is a Spanish seroprevalence population study that found a uh, 11% of prevalence in Madrid in the same dates that our COVID triad study. These results are similar than the, those communicated in, in, other, in, in other papers, for example, in, in London, 
the seroprevalence communicated was 36%. And there are two results that I think that are very, very significant. First is the pre prevalence of asymptomatic patients, 51%. This, this prevalence is approximately the double of that detected in the Spanish seroprevalence study and compares quite well with that report in London or in Wuhan, China. The consequences are that probably the screening on admission does not detect many infected patients, and we need additional diagnostic measures in order to control possible future waves of the disease. And maybe the, the main result of this study is the inadequate serologic response to symptomatic COVID disease. Only 75% developed antibodies, and in the whole cohort of the patients, all are going to have a rapid decline of anti SARS CoV 2 antibodies at four weeks. In symptomatic patients, 15% became negative at four weeks, but in asymptomatic patients, 77% of the patients became negative. This is much higher than the same results in healthy people eh, observed in the seroprevalence Spanish study. And this inadequate immune response raised questions about the reinfection risk of our patients. We don't know if our hemodialysis patients have more risk to reinfection with the disease because we have no enough data to assess uh, this problem. And the other problem that will be discussed by Dr. Gassenborg is the effectiveness of the vaccines. Uh, and probably it should be lower than in general population. Since the publication of our study, other papers have analyzed the dynamics of antibodies in dialysis. This is in 83 hemodialysis patients retrospective with se uh, severe COVID disease. Uh, in this paper, they analyze nucleocapsid antibodies, and what they say is that 25% became negative at six months. And this is another paper that I think is very interesting because shows the relevance of the type of antibody to use. These patients were regularly, regularly screened for nucleocapsid protein and for anti receptor binding domain antibodies. And what they find is that at six months, all our patients with PCR positive and antibodies when they are screened, and at six months, 64% of the patient had anti-nucleocapsid protein antibodies, but 20% more of the patient, 85%, still had receptor binding domain antibodies. They analyze also what happened in some patients who lost both anti-NP and anti-RBD antibodies. And they show that in eight of 10 patients, they could detect T cell responses. So uh, we don't know if this immunity is enough to prevent a reinfection of our patient. And we should know um, probably with more studies uh, or with the studies with the vaccines that will be uh, show later. So uh, our teaching points of this study is or are the severity of SARS-CoV infection in hemodialysis is uh, important, high incidence, high symptomatic COVID mortality, at least in the first wave in Madrid, high prevalence of asymptomatic disease, 51% in this study that was prospective with a very important number of patients, and this makes detection difficult and, requ and requires early screening diagnosis, diagnosis strategies. And the, one of the most important results is that our patients have an, in, an inadequate serologic response, rapid decline of antibodies in four weeks. And this raises doubts about the risk of the infections and the response to vaccines in our patients. We suggest that it's necessary to perform periodic screening to assess the serology state status in our population. We have now some studies about the 
vaccine, vaccine response in our patient. Here is the same COVAC uh, from the Spanish Society of Nephrology and uh, the Repovac uh, renal failure study that, sorry, immune response study that uh, probably uh, Dr. Gainsford will show us some, some slides about this study. Uh, nothing else, uh, thanks to all the people that has, uh, has participated in this COVID free study. Jose, Roberto, thank you so much for your fantastic presentation. Really interesting to see what you've managed in Madrid across all of those hemodialysis centers. Um, a bit frightening as a nephrologist, uh, seeing that data from, um, you know, symptomatic COVID with such rapid reductions in um, those uh, humoral responses. I guess there was a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. You sort of alluded to eight out of 10 people having ongoing T cell immunity. Mm -hmm. um, do we know yet whether or not these humoral responses where you see rapid declines correlate with more rapid declines in T cell immunity longer term? Have we got longer term data yet in dialysis populations looking at cellular immunity? Well, you don't have, don't have information about uh, the immune response uh, uh, from the point of view of um, cellular immune. Uh, immunity, but probably Ron, we will talk, uh, we will present later on some uh, early results from, from the, the study. Uh, we really don't know even in the general population how long will the vaccine or the infection protect our patient from, from a new infection. We have no enough information. We have scanty cases of a second reinfection in patients who had suffered a COVID disease and uh, some cases also, especially in transplant patients that has been, uh, that has received a vaccine and has a reinfection. So I consider that uh, the result that uh, Ron probably will present after us uh, will be very interesting because the immune cellular are probably uh, more um, prolonged in time and probably will protect our patient in the future. I hope. <laughs> so the, the question of reinfection is quite interesting. Um, so what the idea of the vaccines reducing risk of hospitalization and mortality post vaccination, do we find that patients with the hemodialysis patients that have been reinfected have a lower mortality? Obviously, they've been selected for surviving mm -hmm. their first infection. But have we got anything that's reassuring from that data that some of this humoral or at least cellular response is protecting them from death? Or are there just too few cases? Yes. <laughs> too few cases. So Ron, have you got any um, particular questions about the, the these native exposures to COVID-19 and the immune responses for Jose and Roberta? Yeah, thank you, Will. And uh, let me first start with congratulating Drs. Alcazar, Royal, and Portales, uh, because I think this is an important study and gaining all these data in the times of a COVID pandemic that must really have been a challenge. We know that especially Spain was hit so hard during the first wave. And you mm -hmm. show a high prevalence, uh, of course, of the disease, high mortality in symptomatic patients, but surprisingly also a very high prevalence of asymptomatic uh, uh, patients. Um, and that brings me also to my question, how important is the fact that there are asymptomatic patients? Are they able to spread the disease? Are they able to infect other patients, for instance, in your unit? because you are suggesting that we should screen for it, um, but why would we screen? Uh, I think that um, it's important to identify patients with asymptomatic disease because they, they do not uh, infect another patients in the, inside the hemodialysis unit. Uh, we all use masks, uh, distance between them, but they share public transport. Eh? And most of the patients here in, uh, in Spain share ambulance that, uh, that uh, 
uh, take the patient from one point to another point. The patient in, in dialysis, uh, when, when they finish the dialysis, many of them have the mask down. They share during half an hour or one hour the uh, space, very little space. And this is the main, probably one of the main uh, source of infection in our patients. I don't know if asymptomatic patients are, are able to infect another one, but the results of this study and another, another study published uh, in Spain in, uh, in Clinical Kidney Journal shows uh, that one of the main uh, source of infection were shared ambulance transport. And this is, and I think that's the reason that we have to assess all the patients, especially uh, when we have the peak of incidents. We now are going down in the fourth wave, but we're not sure that we are going to have a fifth, a fifth wave or a sixth one. We don't know, but we have to be prepared for that. Yeah, but do you know from your experience or from data from literature, whether it were the asymptomatic patients that infected the other patients while sharing an ambulance, for instance, or when they share transportation, of course, they have many contacts also with the driver, ambulance uh, personnel, hospital personnel, etc. So are they really uh, the source of uh, the infection? Because yes. when you were right, and then we should scream. We don't have any strong evidence about it because it's very difficult to distinguish mm -hmm. among different sources of infection, especially when you are involved in a, in a wave of a high intensity pandemic. Nobody knows where the patient gets the infection, but uh, we have found uh, a strong relationship about the risk and the use of this kind of transplantation, for example, and uh, even in the nursing home. So we believe that real, this should be the main focus for the infection. After we, is, I believe that it's almost impossible to know where came the, the yeah. infection for a single patient, for a given single patient. And the situation is very different if you are in the middle of a high incident wave of pandemic or as now in a low incident of pandemic. But then you were to start uh... Uh, to start screening, um, yeah. and what would that look like, that advice to screen? Because at first there were some centers that said you have to screen once every two weeks, then it yeah. became once every week, and it <laughs> became once every dialysis session. And... <laughs> That's the question. Yeah. In, in, our, in, in our experience and yeah, um, with our data, you have a very short window period to catch the positive patient. Because if you keep in mind our result, in, a, in four weeks, we almost three out of every four patients have got a negative uh, uh, serology again. So probably we recommend to, to perform at least month analysis especially if you want to classify properly your patient, because if you have a, a new uh, high incident way, you have to prepare to classify your patient. And very important for you, if the patient has been exposed or not to the, to the virus. Okay. So, um, this is very interesting, sort of pre-vaccine era data. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you alluded to a few times the, the fact that we're now moving into a new phase where we have some data on vaccine responses. I wonder if this is a good time to now share your slides, Ron, and present some of your data, and then we'll come back yeah. to these discussions. So yeah, I would be happy to do so. Can you show my slides, Will? Yeah, so can you see them there? Yes, yeah. And this slide shows you the COVID-19 vaccine studies in patients on kidney function replacement uh, treatment. And I made this slide, uh, I think, three, four weeks ago. And nowadays, I think that there are four or five reports coming out every week. So it is already a little bit outdated. There are more studies, but I don't 
think that these results show you a pretty good uh, uh, general picture. The top part of the slide are the vaccine studies in patients on hemodialysis. And what you can see is that the number of subjects per group is relatively small. It are most of the time um, uncontrolled studies performed with Pfizer vaccine in which subjects gave two doses of uh, uh, the Pfizer vaccine. And when you look at the zero conversion rate in hemodialysis patients, it is for, for me at least somewhat surprising to see such a high zero conversion rate. It ranges between 80% and 96%, uh, some differences between uh, studies. The lower part of this slide shows you the kidney transplant uh, studies. Uh, again, uh, most studies have have been performed with the Pfizer vaccine, some with the Moderna vaccine, and there you see a completely different picture, a much lower rate of zero conversion, ranging between 6%, and I think that is inappropriately low. Um, most studies that you now see are between the 20 and uh, around 50%. Can I have the next slide? Um, this uh, study shows you uh, one of um, um, uh, the studies that have been performed. This one came from France, single center study, 208 transportation patients looking at the anti-spike IgG zero response 28 days after the second vaccination. And this uh, slide investigates the influence of immunosuppression. What you can see on the left that in subjects that are using cell set, so MMF, um, there's especially a low response. Um, when you look at prednisolone, you can also see that there is a difference in calcineurin inhibitors. But when you do then a multivariate regression analysis, and that comes from most studies, it is especially cell set MMF that seems to be the agent that is to blame. On the right, uh, you can also see that calcineurin inhibitors, what I've think is interesting that you can find a kind of uh, dose response curve that with tachrodomus that we also as clinicians know as a more stronger immunosuppressant has also a lower zero response rate than on cyclosporin. But once again, cell sept MMF, especially probably the drug to be blamed. Next uh, slide, please. This is another study. This is uh, from the Charité Hospital in uh, Berlin published in the British Medical Journal. Um, most studies are uncontrolled. Beautiful thing of this study is that it studied healthy controls, small numbers though, transplant recipients and hemodialysis patients. And in this study, again, two doses of Pfizer assessing day 28 zero response. And on the left top, you see the zero conversion rate of the IgG response directed against the spike protein. And you see in healthy controls, 100% uh, response. Hemodialysis patients slightly lower, but seems reasonable. But in kidney transplant uh, recipients, it is very low in this study. When in the figure, the graph just below it, although there is an 80% zero response in hemodialysis patients, when you look at the individual IgG responses, it is significantly lower. So although these data suggest that it might be yeah, felt reassuring that there's an 80% or 90% zero response rate in dialysis patients, the actual IgG titer, titer is much lower and we still do not know what is the surrogate of protection, what level of IgG. They also looked at neutralizing antibodies, so exactly the same, and they also looked at uh, spike IgA response, mucosal response, again seeing that uh, hemodialysis patients do fairly well, but they are especially the kidney transplant recipients that uh, are doing worse. Now you have the next slide. Um, and in this study uh, from the Charité, it was not only control, but the other great thing is that they also looked at the cellular response. And that was what Dr. Portoles and Arroyo, uh, Alcazar Arroyo also mentioned. Um, when you look at the CD4 uh, helper T cell response, it was reasonable in all groups, 
but when you look at the CD8 plus cytotoxic T cells, that was less impressive data, and especially there in the transplant uh, group, um, uh, a low response, suggesting that in transplant recipients, there's a low serial response, but also a low cellular response. And may I have the next slide? These were all uh, relatively small scale studies. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and uncontrolled. And that was the reason that we in the Netherlands designed the RECOVAC study. And RECOVAC uh, is a, a, a chronomim for a renal patients COVID-19 vaccination study, in which we include four cohorts in four university medical centers. We include healthy controls, reasonably large numbers, also uh, patients with impaired kidney function, hemoperitoneal dialysis uh, patients and kidney transplant recipients, looking at the endpoints, IgG serial response, durability of the IgG response, cellular response and safety, and especially focusing on day 28 after the second vaccination. Next slide, please. And these are some preliminary data. Um, it's written here confidential, but there are now more than 300 people looking and it's also recorded. So that confidential, it's not anymore. But when we look in our uh, 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 study, we also see that there is quite a good serial response in most patients with chronic kidney disease, only not in the subjects with a kidney transplant, where we noticed 40 to 50 percent responses. But again, when looking at the individual responses to the IgG titer, you can see that in hemodialysis patients, especially more the case than in peritoneal dialysis and more the case than in CKD stages uh, four and five, that the titers are lower than in the healthy controls. Next slide, please. We also looked at uh, uh, cellular response, and this is a functional uh, uh, T cell assay. And we also noticed that in kidney transplant recipients, there was a very low cellular response. And then it becomes important, how do these correlate? And that was already also mentioned uh, in around nine patients, but may I have the next slide? In uh, this graph, we have on the x-axis, the cellular response, and on the y-axis, the humoral response. So the humoral response, the IgG titer. And when there would be a perfect correlation, all people would be in the left below quadrant or the right upper quadrant. And most subjects are in these quadrants. But what you can also see is that in some subjects that do have humoral response, we did not notice a functional cellular response. So our data as yet, but it might also be dependent on what kind of assay you're using, we have a lower cellular response. So um, you notice that in the patient that did not have a humoral response, cellular response took over. In our experience, it might be that the cellular response is less impressive actually than the humoral response. And uh, I think that was my last slide, but please check it, uh, Bill. Oh no, when we have these data, it is of course now important to notice how effective vaccination is. And that's especially the case in transplant uh, recipients. There we notice there's uh, insufficient IgG response, insufficient cellular response. And now the first data are coming out of COVID-19 breakthrough. And these were two studies uh, published uh, three weeks ago, one in transportation, one in Kidney International, the first one, a United States study, the second one a fr French study, and they looked at the number of uh, subjects that had a complete COVID-19 vaccination, but then still found 14 solid organ transplant recipients that had COVID-19 breakthrough. They looked at whether these patients required hospitalization, that was 50% of cases, and mortality was 7% of cases. In the French study that was somewhat larger, they had 55 uh, subjects, transplant recipients that had a breakthrough. 27% required hospitalization, 11% were admitted to an intensive care unit, 
and 5% died. And when we compare these data to the registry data that we have, these data seem better because kidney transplant recipients require hospitalization in 50 to 75% of cases. Um, admission to an intensive care unit is also somewhat higher and mortality is 15 to 20%, depending on which study you read. And here we notice 5% to 7%. So there seems to be some protection, but protection is inadequate. In the general population after the vaccination, we see hardly any mortality. Here it is still 7% to 5%. And in the French study, they also had data about uh, IgG titers in 25 uh, subjects um, that had COVID breakthrough. And 24 out of these 25 actually had a negative IgG titer after the second vaccination, suggesting that Titer is important and is a kind of surrogate for uh, protection. And then finding so many patients without a sufficient IgG titer is an extremely important finding and we have to improve that, I think. And that uh, actually was my last slide. Thank you, Ron. That's utterly brilliant um, data um, and utterly amazing to have it seeing in the context as we're seeing all of this emerge. So I think um, a bit depressing, I have to say, um, for us as nephrologists, um, particularly for the kidney transplant recipients. Um, so um, uh, have you managed to have a look to see whether or not you can predict the types of patients within, obviously the modality transplantation versus hemodialysis seems to be a predictor of low response. Um, have you had a look at wh why patients with PD might be doing better in terms of response than hemodialysis or if there are characteristics of certain patients within the hemodialysis population which predict a lower response? Do we know who is not responding to the vaccines? within those cohorts and who are? Um, the, we did, but also some other studies did uh, multivariate regression analysis, looking at predictors. And it seems especially that age is important, that higher age is associated with a lower response and that also a higher comorbidity index. And I think that is also what was described in the in the data from uh, uh, Portales and Alcazar Arroyo, um, also seeing that age and um, uh, comorbidity are important there. Mm -hmm. um, and indeed, it is slightly depressing because in the Netherlands, we are opening up. From this weekend on, we don't need to wear any facial mask anymore. Um, but when you now look at the data of the transplant uh, recipients, yeah, it is the question um, whether these can have the same joy of opening up and uh, or that they actually have to remain in the uh, in isolation. Yeah, probably we uh, need some warning by health officials regarding when, when this data become available. Yeah, probably we should consider the transplantation uh, in this era as the early post transplant situation. When you discharge a transplanted patient from the hospital, you recommend the patient to wear a mask during the first three months because the immunosuppression is so high that they need to be protected. I consider that with this last uh, surprising slide, we should recommend the, the transplant patient to keep with the uh, protection measures because although the mortality is not so high, but 7% of mortality is uh, important for me. Mortality is still very high. So the role of screening people 28 days post second vaccine um, run, it seems to be that a humoral response might give us some idea of a humoral and a cellular response um, and selecting people for third vaccines. Is that something which you are going to do in an extension of this study? Um, is this something which has already been trialed? Yeah, that's... Uh... That's what we are uh, proposing to do, is that we are 
go and to screen patients for an IgG titer, and when there's a non-response or a low response, um, give them a booster. And yep. then again, looking at titer, mm -hmm. and in case then on the third dose, they have not uh, uh, responded, yeah, then we should, should look for something new perhaps. So higher dosages of uh, the vaccine, uh, tapering immunosuppressants, um, or trying another vaccine, um, so heterologous uh, uh, vaccination. Um, and we are proposing to do that in a clinical trial. Yes, could be the same that many, many years ago with the B hepatitis vaccine, because we use routinely double doses and a booster dose at the end to get a better response. Probably we should learn about how to use these new vaccines in our extremely immunosuppressive patients. Yeah, because what they're doing now already in France is giving everybody a, a booster vaccination. Yeah. And then measuring IgG titers. And I think from a patient perspective, that, that's good because I think it will help. Although we, there are very limited data at the moment. Um, but whether it's the best approach, I don't know. Uh, it might be a better approach to uh, increase the dose of the vaccine, for instance, or do a heterologous uh, vaccination or taper immunosuppressants. Um, yeah. So I think that this type of studies are definitely needed to give us the answer. Um, also with hepatitis B, they have some studies, but yeah, most of is still expert opinion how to deal uh, with uh, hepatitis B and uh, and a low zero response there. I have a question. I like all of your presentation and these works because I think that they are really needed. We do not know anything about COVID-19 and we need to know. So thank you for these two nice works. I have a question for Dr. Portoles. Uh, did, you, did you study the patients that had a previous kidney transplant? Did you get any difference in terms of antibody titers? No, we have, not, we have not analyzed it, but probably in the light of this new result, we get back to the, the database and check for the active immunosuppression in, in the patient, including our studies and try to compare it because probably we will find some differences. But I believe, Ron, I have to, Congratulate for this uh, presentation. It's very inter interesting for, for us. And you should publish as soon as possible because <laughs> your result probably will, will change the health policy in many countries. Because uh, the result is, I have a, a lot of concern about the response of the transplant patient to the vaccine. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, um, my Jose, for uh, this suggestion. We will try to get this data in the database and check for it. I, I, I would also suggest not just past history of transplant, but past history of, of immune suppression, for yes, example, right. for gonorrhitis. And, mm -hmm. and that, that was the question I had for Ron, whether these hemodialysis patients that failed completely to respond in terms of antibodies, did they have a history of past immune suppression? Um, no, we selected our patients uh, with the exclusion criterion of uh, past immune suppressant use. Yeah. And these were all patients that did not have a prior transplantation, that also did not have glomerulonephritis that was treated with immunosuppression. Yeah. So yeah. Um, we have actually reasonable data, still a lower IgG titer, and that's not because they used immunosuppressant at this moment or in the past. And, the, and do you have difference regarding the indu induction treatment, Ron? Um, no, I can't say that we haven't looked at it uh, in detail, um, but I think also the, uh, the numbers are too low um, to draw any conclusion there. I think then, in that case, we need more data from several studies and combine them. Okay. okay and what about the, the decay of the antibody response in the, in the RICOVAC uh, study? Do you have data in, 
four, six, eight weeks, uh, if the decline of the antibody response is different between the different groups to have an alert? Um, no, we don't have these data in our study yet. Um, um, oh. Yeah. Um, now a couple of months on the way, so um, in I think a couple of weeks we'll start measuring at month six. But there are some data from literature, what you also show is that there is a decline, but what is the clinical relevance of that observation? Um, do these people really lose um, resistance against uh, uh, the virus? Um, or is this a kind of natural decay, but when they again see the virus, there's an immediate immune response and they uh, can fight the virus. Um, we also know from the data that there are at the moment that the ITG response might go down. We don't know what happens with cellular response, whether that also goes down or whether that remains stable. From other infections, it's known that especially cellular response uh, remains intact more often. Um, yeah, important questions still to be addressed. Yes, I think the, the results of the uh, Rigoac study and the Senkovac study that is, is, is ongoing okay. with the Spanish Society of Nephrology will, be, will give us the answers of that important question. Hope I so. have also a question for, for you. Uh, the patients that, that have COVID after vaccine, uh, and the pa patients that have COVID after positive results, had lower titles of the antibody. Did you check on that? Dr. Portoves? Um, in transplantation or in hemodialysis? In our study? In your study. In our study, uh, we really don't know. No, uh, the, the, the titles of, of antibody, the, the, the response, the titles of IgG in uh, hemodialysis patients with asymptomatic disease were lower than the titers in symptomatic disease. Uh, it, it seems that with symptomatic disease you have a very high titer and they decline uh, in the in the time. But asymptomatic, uh, we don't measure in all the patients the titers, but the results we have in a, in in half of the patients so that asymptomatic patients have lower titers than symptomatic COVID patients. Okay, it's important to, to say that in our study, no one, no, 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 a single patient have a symptomatic COVID after a, a previous COVID disease. Okay, okay. Good point. We've got actually, we've um, actually got time for uh, just one um, question from our audience, and I'm just going to pick the sim the simplest question to ask and the most difficult one to answer. <laughs> we came through when we were talking about vaccination, and it uh, and it's just say, what advice would you give to people on dialysis and transplant recipients? What would you give advice would you give to people on dialysis and transplant recipients at this time, given this new data? I think they're all being told by their governments to go back to work um, and um, and as you say to take off the masks um, but this data should bring some caution and I suspect there'll be some patients watching these data and uh, wanting to know what might be the best thing to to them to do at this time difficult given that this data is just emerging but Ron what advice do you give to your dialysis and transport patients that have had two vaccines um, and I'll um, yeah. It's a very difficult. Uh, <laughs> yeah. my, my personal, um, what I do uh, is that it's not only about vaccination of the patient, him or herself. It is also about prevalence of the disease in the population yeah. and whether the family has been vaccinated. Yeah. And we advise especially uh, uh, um, spouses to be vaccinated, but also children. Normally, we would not uh, advise vaccination of children, but in this case, I would. And when the prevalence of the disease is now low in the Netherlands and children and spouses and family is vaccinated, I tell them, OK, you can go out again, you can do work, but you better wear masks, you better wear, uh, uh, wash your hands, keep a distance, etc. Whereas all the other people are probably a, allowed to 
yeah, to be more free there. Uh, but we do have to give them some freedom uh, back, I guess, because yeah, staying in the strict uh, isolation that these people have been living in the last uh, uh, couple of months or even one and a half year, yeah, that, that's inhumane. Mm -hmm. I, I suggest to my patient that they should learn to know if they are in a safe ambient environment or are in an unsafe environment. So if you are close to people who has uh, received a vaccine, like Dr. Alcazar and me, it's not <laughs> all necessary to wear a, a mask, you know? But if you are sharing a room, sharing a car, probably the recommendation nowadays for our patient is wear a mask and clean your hands, especially for transplant patients. It's my opinion. I, I agree with, with Jose. I think that our patients are at high risk of infection and at high risk of mortality. complications with well, on the mortality. We have shown the data. And I think it's uh, it's not the time to say then feel free and uh, take out your mask. I think we have to uh, to lower the the incidence of the disease uh, much uh, before we can say that the patient don't use mask. Uh, you are free to do uh, the same things you do um, previously the previous the pandemic. Hey. Excellent answers. Thank you. Um, thank you for such um, careful consideration of all of your data and the presentation today. It's been fantastic to listen to you all. Thank you, Roberto Alcazar and Jose Portoles. Thank you for your data from Madrid. Please do go to the CKJ website where you can uh, read full, uh, full text of this open access CKJ paper. Our gratitude also to you, Ron, for these preliminary, very exciting data. Enrikovac, I wish you all the best in publication. Ron is also a senior author on another CKJ paper entitled Pitfalls when comparing COVID-19 related outcomes across studies, lessons learned from the ERA CODA collaboration, which I commend to you for your summer holiday reading. Um, before you go, um, please do answer the quick survey on Zoom so that um, we can get your feedback. It helps us keep these e-seminars running um, and uh, we actually will have a summer break too. We're back in a couple of months. Um, so enjoy any time you have off, but do remember to come and make time on Thursday, the 30th of September. We'll send our usual adverts out on media when we're going to return to a subject which is close to my heart and actually the subject of the first CKJ seminar. We now have results from two randomized trials assessing the effects of intradialytic cycling um, uh, on cardiovascular outcomes and quality of life and there's some important results to share with you so enjoy your summer we'll see you in september and thanks very much to our speakers thank you many, many thanks thank you. thank you very much bye bye thank you thank you maria bye.